Okay, it'll be fine. Or I think it will be share. Okay, this is there. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yep. Okay, we're ready to go. Cambrai 6 and 11 are well known as the only 15th century manuscripts with polyphony to survive from Cambrai Cathedral and as an unusual pair of books with common repertory in a with unusual pair of books with common repertory in a different order. Whereas Cambrai 6 is in choir book format with individual mass sections in no particular order, Cambrai 11 is a polyphonic Kyrie with each mass section type grouped, Kyries, then Glorias, and then Kratos, each section beginning on a recto and ending on a verso. Leanne Curtis suggested that Cambrai 6 was copied by Nicolas Grenon in the 1430s, but that Cambrai 11, which was prepared with much greater care, dated from 1442 to 45 and was the work of Simon Mellet. But in his monumental book, Alejandro Planchard claimed instead that Cambrai 6 dated from circa 1434 and was the work of an unknown scribe who was not Grenon. To Planchart, Cambrai 11 was copied by Millet in 1442. These dates of copying correspond to Du Fay's two returns to Cambrai from the Savoy court, the first in October 1434 and the second in December 1439, where after he began his new position as master of the Petit Vicaire precisely in 1442. The two manuscripts were still in use in the 16th century to judge from the scribbled names probably of choir boys on the fly leaves, and I will discuss their use later on. Most of the mass polyphony in the two choir books by Banchois du Fay and English composers would soon fill, if it had not already, an array of manuscripts associated with the chapel singers of the courts of Savoy, Burgundy, and the Council of Basel, or with musicians in the Veneto. These manuscripts include Canonici 213, Bologna Q15, the St. Emmeram Codex, the Trent Codices, and the Aosta Codex, manuscripts that have been the bread and butter of the discipline of musicology. Yet Cambrai 6 and 11 also include anonymous mass movements with monophony and mensural notation <coughs> that are unique to one or both manuscripts. I contend that they could be a key to the origin of the repertory in the two manuscripts <coughs> and hope that this audience may recognize them or their stylistic features. In what follows, I try to determine why these two manuscripts contain what they do, <coughs> the origin and possible symbolism of different kinds of measured monophony or cantus fractus, and the place of mensural chant at Cambrai Cathedral, where the Marian sequence Mittedad Virginem even receives the modus cum tempore sign O3 in Cambrai 12, a gradual of circa 1540. Cambrai 11 pairs no mass ordinary sections, and the pairs in Cambrai 6 are not paired elsewhere. Only a three-voice Gloria Credo pair by Banchois that's separate but present in Cambrai 6 and 11 traveled as a pair. All other mass sections in the two books are scattered in their concordant sources. The Banchois Gloria and Credo open Oxford Canonici 213 and are the second and third works in Trent 92. To these two movements, a Kyrie 9 for Feasts of the Virgin must be added that was paired with the Gloria only in Trent 87, but is also in Bologna Q15 and cited by Tinctoris, but not in Cambrai 6 or 11. The Credo by Banchois of our pair, called Aversi in the 213 index, is also in Bologna Q15 and cited by Tinctoris. 
any possible initial grouping of these three movements is called into question, however, because another Banshwa credo is more similar to this Gloria in having alternating circle and cut circle signatures. That credo was copied separately in Trent 92 and is in both Cambrai 6 and 11, but not elsewhere. The sources for the paired mass sections, Canoni, Chi 213, and Trent 92, date from around the same time, but the former is Venetian and the latter is associated with the Council Chapel in Basel. The beginning of Canoni, Chi 213 was the last gathering to be copied and was finished around 1436 by the presumed scribe Johannes de Quadris, an Italian composer associated with St. Mark's in Venice. Trent 92 is thought to have been copied by Nicolas Merck in the region of Strasbourg, Basel between 1430 to 40, and Merck was a singer in the chapel of the Council of Basel. So that these two mass sections were copied as a pair at such a distance from each other, and at the beginning of important manuscripts with substantial but different repertories and around the same time, suggests an important or could suggest an important occasion for the initial use of these mass sections. And there is distinctive red notation in the credo at, at unam sanctam catholicam et apostolicam ecclesiam, and then in remissio peccatorum. This is speculation, but could these mass sections have been performed when the Council of Basel officially began on 25th of July, 1431, in the cathedral, a mass at which Pope Eugenius IV was present, although soon afterwards he tried to dissolve the council. Duke Philip of Burgundy, with Banshua and his employ, was a supporter of Eugenius. The Marian period would then have been added later, perhaps even with the Credo by Banshua, more like the Gloria. In any case, the Banshua mass pairs were no longer paired when these sections reached Cambrai and must have been considered old. It's worth it noting that the alternatum technique of the Gloria and Credo was described already as a kind of polyphonic singing by the theorist Jacobus in his book six of his treatise and was associated with angelic jubilation in the 15th century. The instability of the just described Banshois mass pair provides a backdrop against which the transmission of the anonymous polyphonic and monophonic ordinary sections should be understood. Another instability I will not discuss is transmission of some of the mass sections in French black or white notation, except to say that the use of white French notation in Italy early on was an ingenious way to distinguish the French notation visually from the older Italian notation. White notation was adopted much later in Cambrai. I now describe the anonymous polyphony and then the menstrual monophony. Cambrai 6 and 11 include two anonymous three-voice menstrual credos that are unica. The first with final F in whose patrem tenor melody is not identified alternates polyphony and monophony. Followed, um, it begins with the patrem in polyphony, then the chorus sings monophony at factorem. Uh, here you can see the rest of the credo. Uh, here you can see the chorus marking in the upper left corner. And here again, all, the alternation between the polyphony and the chorus. And then uh, the movement uh, ends with the chorus singing the monophony uh, so that the you can see some more. And here you can see it ends with the monophony so that the amen will be sung in polyphony. The second anonymous credo just below, you can see the patrim, is monophonic in mensural notation and with a G final and B flat in the signature, so a transposed mode too. It begins with a patrim in long, 
lungs, whose pitches matched those of an Agnus in the Libra's Wallace at page 56 for Feast of the Third Class, but the remainder of the chant differs. The monophony at factorum is in C dot time, but changes to O at qui propter, has coronas at ex Maria Virgine, changes back to C at et in spiritum, and to O for the final amen. Here you see the rest of the movement. So again, it has its own kind of alternatum. And also notice the predominance of semi-breves, breves, semi-breves, and later on we'll see minims. That is the typical notation of these manuscripts. The mass sections in Cambrai 6 and 11 in polyphony do not include a sanctus or agnus, probably because they were not for use at the high mass, but in side chapels with a shorter Eucharist, if it was included at all. That Cambrai 11 ends with a monophonic Sanctus and Agnus, both transpose deep plagal and in menstrual notation in circle, which do in fact belong with the preceding monophonic credo, suggests a new use of the repertory in the Cambrai manuscript 11 and change, possibly changes to the, the liturgy that prompted this. The Sanctus melody is Tannebauer 88. There's a very long Ozana, you'll see that melismatic section. The Agnus Day begins like Schildbach 103. At question, I think, is if these movements were um, from Cambrai or possibly Paris, or if they, like the other polyphony, were brought west to Cambrai from the council or a court. The monophonic anonymous cantus fractus includes some ordinary sections only in Cambrai 6 and 11 and some only in Cambrai 11, like this, those uh, sanctus and agnus that you just saw. An anonymous monophonic Kyrie is number 19 in Cambrai 6 and number 7a in Cambrai 11. The Kyrie intonation is known, it's Melniki 224. It's paired with the monophonic Gloria in Cambrai 6, but that Gloria is separate as number 15 in Cambrai 11. In Cambrai 6, here you can see the, uh, the Patrem, it's followed by a Credo. Uh, and this is the melody of the Agnus 14 for Feasts of the Third Class. There are two layers of monophony on the fly leaves of the Cambrai manuscripts. Only the earlier sequence, Salve Decus Puritatis, is an unicum, is a mensural notation that's really early and actually Franconian. The text follows a common 13th century 8787 pattern in each of its eight half verses. Um, because it's an unicum, it could be a local composition, and several Cambrai bishops resided in Paris in the 13th century. The cathedral's books of sequences that survive lack the chant. Salve Decus begins with the descent of a fifth, but its melody is unlike that of Salve Regina. Its text emphasizes Mary's purity, piety, virtue, power against evils, and hope in general, and is especially appropriate for the Assumption. Stanza two is filled with familiar Marian metaphors, Stella Maris, Spes Salutis, Portus Indulgentiae, etc. But stanza three ends with Maria Plena Grazia, a reminder of the Latin Archithistos hymn sung at the cathedral. Some Dominican Marian sequences have comparable text inchipits and syllable counts, but those with similar inchipits uh, do not begin with the descent of the fifth, and their language is different from that of Salve Decus. The only melismas of the sequence decorate the words cordium and filium at the ends of stanzas 4a and 4b. Only in Cambrai 6 are two hymns. Yam Ter Quaternas for Passion Sunday, the fifth Sunday in Lent, and Sunday before Easter, 
and two settings of O Quam Glorifica Luce for the Assumption. All are anonymous in three voice mensural polyphony with the complete text in the top voice. It's useful to compare a sequence Craig Wright has attributed to Du Fayi, Nuper Almus Rose Flores, which is 8787 like Salve Decus, in the mid 15th century gradual Florence Laurentian Library, Edilium 151, Folio 10V. Wright claims it was composed by Du Fay for the dedication of the Duomo in 1436, and Planchart wrote that nothing in the melody precludes Du Fay as the man who generated it. There's no other surviving sequence melody attributable to Du Fay because Carlier's Mitidad Sterilem of the Recollectio was set to the melody of Mitidad Virginem. But the melody of Nuper Almus indeed is new and demonstrates the modal clarity and attention to text accent that I find in Du Fay's chant for the office Tenebrae de Fugium. It moves in the appropriate tetrachord, pentachord, or octave, and higher pitches are often given to accented syllables. Right note, notice the similarity of the melody of this sequence, Nuper Almos, to Laudas Crucis, but no exact match to that melody has been found. Like many of Du Fay's antiphons and responsories, all phrases of the melody end with subtonal cadences, but these are actually already found in Notker's Lieber in Norum. That this sequence is not a counterfact shows that Du Fayi knew the chant repertory well enough to choose not to copy from it. At question is exactly is whether Nupar almost could be considered to be in cantus fractus. It appears to be notated in a regular series of briefs, but in fact, most, if not all, have very thin stems going down to the right, and so are longs of the kind we see in Cambrai 6 and 11 at the beginning of some glorias and credos. Would it have been performed slowly or rhythmically, given the accentuation of this text? In other words, was notated conscious fractus necessary for the rhythmic performance, or was it sometimes assumed? The polyphonic mitted ad virginem setting, Hammond Planchart attributed to do Fayi, that's three thick, number 336 in Bologna Q15, and also in Trent 92, has alternating verses in cantus fractus, and the mitted ad virginum in Cambrai 12 is in conscious fractus with the modus cum tempore sign O3. So um, I'm wondering if, in this case, this is Florence, it's a beautiful manuscript, if the conscious fractus actually needed to be notated or if it would have been sung in rhythm anyway. I also ask if the resulting triple meter might have had a symbolic meaning. And in this text, where the syllable counts eight plus seven significant, because eight is the number of Christ's resurrection and seven that of the Virgin Mary. We also have to ask what Cantus Fractus was. The Lexicon Musicum Latinum does not provide a clear answer. Calvin Bauer's English translation defines it as a polyphonic composition that proceeds in rapid note values and employs dissonance as a result of diminution based on simple counterpoint. The earliest source is Roberto Stahandlo of 1326, who lists a cantifractus between the core and estampete in a series of dances but an anonymous somewhat later author describes it as a kind of parallel counterpoint like Faberden, so a song divided into two voices. Only Prostochimus writes that short notes are characteristic of it, but none of these definitions suggest the term that the term would have been applied to monophony or that it would have been appropriate for sequence or mass ordinary sections. A verb that's applied to monophony from the 13th century onwards is frangura, with fractus as perfect participle, meaning either to divide a note value into shorter notes, or to apply the procedure of diminution, or to progress in counterpoint with diminution, or to progress in a direction with disjunct motion. 
This term meaning division into shorter note values is applied to plain chant tenors by Lambertus. What seems possible is that such fracturing spread whatever it was from Paris to other university centers, which would have included Prague and Bologna. And that would suggest the technique of an educated class. From the region of Paris, is early chant noted, notated in rhythmic notation, that is in stemmed and unstemmed briefs. That's part of the Historia for the Crown of Thorns from Sens, where the crown from Constantinople was first formally received. This earliest office for the Crown of Thorns was composed in 1240 by Gautier Cornu and survives in Latin 1028 in Paris. Here the virga, or what looks like a long, begins and ends words. It's not part of a regular rhythmic pattern, but seems to be used for expression. The chants with the alternating virga and punctum are only the hymn for lots, responses and verses for the hours referring to God or the crown, and the prose of the mass here, regis et pontificis. Might this device then have had a Christological significance that would explain its presence, especially in Crato's sequences and in the Sanctus and Agnus Dei of Cambrai 11? It's also used in some but not all hymns, but at Cambrai they included Conditor Ame Cedarum, which begins the Advent season, and Mitted Ad Virginem is an Annunciation chant, Feast of the Incarnation of Christ, as was Dufai's Nuper Almus, since the Florentine Duomo was dedicated on that feast day. The triple meter would normally have Trinitarian symbolism, however, Mary Channon Caldwell examined the use of hocket in the liturgy and noted that it was found especially in the period leading up to Christmas as on St. Nicholas Day or at Easter. Think of the inseculum hockets on the Hectius tenor. The polyphony in Cambrai 6 and 11 was transmitted widely, and the procedure of using menstrual notation for the mass ordinary was also common in regions participating in the repertory associated with the Council of Basel. Cantus Fractus was discussed in Bohemia, while Gilles Carlier was there. Carlier had been assigned to the contingent to go to Prague after 14 April 1434. On 25 July 1434, decisions of an Utrechtist synod held at the Church of St. James included one item on music. Let priests pronounce the epistle and gospel in the vernacular. Let both leave off discant with the breaking up of the voice for the occasion for certain reasons, unless there's by unanimous consent a reasonable cause for resuming them, and let the creed be read or chanted at an appropriate time. The next year, the Council of Basel made decisions about sacred worship that included a complaint about singing syncopando, a manuscript from Regensburg, thought to date from 1435 to 1443, which contains five credos and six curies in mensural notation, or cantus fractus, is the Sankt Emmeram Codex. And I bring this up for comparison to the Cambrai manuscripts. Uh, CLM 14274 in the Bavarian State Library is the work of the schoolmaster Pötzinger of Regensburg. The manuscript also includes polyphonic mass sections by Dufay, Banchois, and others, a few in the two Cambrai manuscripts, others with other concordances. I showed just the Bean Contus Fractus to see if you recognize them. They were all copied by the same scribe. The mensural notation is the same in all the credos and follows the accentuation of the text. The curies use hoofnagel notation, however, and a kind of stroke notation. Their style is marked by repetition of short phrases. Here, see first the credos. And you can see the note values are the same here. number five. And here the very different credo, the Kyrie in black notation. There's another one. 
here is a Kyrie inserted, which is in three parts and in black mensural notation. And then there are two more Kyrie's on this page, one with what looks like stroke notation. Here is the table of contents. Uh, many of these have been identified. Finally, there is this polyphonic composition, O Maria Virgo Pia, and this provides a trope text for an amen to a credo in Cambrai 6 and 11 that's announced in Cambrai 11 by the words O Maria written in red above the beginning of that credo. And this same credo receives a different trope in Q15, verses from the Easter chant found in Hungary and southern Germany, Surgit Christus cum Trofeo, about which I spoke in my last paper. So the Surgit Christus does seem to have a more Eastern circulation. For what use were the two choir books copied at Cambrai destined? Leanne Curtis suggested they were for the left choir, the side of the cantor, giving an entry that matches their content in an inventory. Yet others assumed that the two manuscripts were for both sides of the main choir because of their identical content. Curtis and Planchart noticed some differences, however. There is editing of one credo, and he agreed and also he agreed with Curtis that the manuscripts were copied from different earlier exemplars. They contain no alternatum settings requiring both manuscripts, and they could have been used singly by singers at one lectern. These suggest to me that Cambrai 11 was a replacement rather than a complement to Com uh, Cambrai 6, which would make sense for foundations made in perpetuity. So I list these, these uh, foundations here, um, and you can see uh, there are a number of masses. These were held in the most important chapels of Cambrai. The Chapel of the Reliquaries had all of the important ones that were very old. The Trinity Chapel had the main painting of the Virgin after 1451, but not at the time Cambrai 6 and 11 was copied. But this foundation was made by Pierre Dailly, an important bishop. Uh, the Flemish Virgin, this was also an important chapel associated with Tournai. And then this daily Marian Mass was founded also by Pierre Dailly. And then we have the record of the Petit Vicaire who sang polyphony, singing a Monday Mass in the Trinity Chapel. In his articles on Cambrai, Craig Wright concluded that polyphony sung in the chapels or by the choir boys in the main choir was sung by the singers grouped at a single lectern, but the, that the vicars sang from lecterns on either side of the choir. He cites early 16th century payments for the copying of masses in duplicate, but for both sides of the choir, but no earlier document. As copied in Cambrai 11, the masses show a variety of cleft combinations. Some were perfect for the Petit Vicaire or for the Maître de Chant and choir boys. Others required ensembles of all adult singers. So this was a varied repertory. The repertory would thus be suitable for the chapel masses and those of the main choir. The repertory on the fly leaves also includes other Marian polyphony, the, but this is not um, mensural. The Alleluia verse, I believe, might have been composed by Du Fai. The sequence has uh, Marian language that matches uh, the tympanum of the north entrance to Cambrai Cathedral. It describes the Virgin in heaven, super chorus angelorum exaltata s o domina, and that phrase is at the very middle of the sequence. Uh, and uh, there is also a text in this that reminds of the Salve Regina. Uh, 
the, this Marian content of Cambrai 6 and 11, which is independent of the liturgical calendar and the flyleaf chant reminding of the cathedral's Marian tympanum, suggests that the two manuscripts, Cambrai 6 and 11, which were kept in the choir, would have been used as necessary individually or together for the chant on the fly leaves for Bishop Pierre Dailly's choir foundation and for the founded masses in the chapels of the Reliquaries Trinity and Flemish Virgin, give it, Virgin, given that two sets of polyphonic soloists for the two sides of the main choir are not called for by this repertory and seem not to be documented at the cathedral before the 16th century. The repertory of these manuscripts, which is homogeneous in dating mostly from before 1436 and at the latest 1442, in its black mensural notation of actually mid 14th century France with red notes, mostly briefs, semi-briefs and minims, and including lengthy or emphasized amens, is French, courtly and international, a repertory that would be appropriate in a distinguished cathedral's most important chapel and for chapels and the foundation of its most illustrious Bishop Pierre Dailly. This repertory is certainly not Italian or German. It could be papal or from Dijon, the Savoy court, or the council chapel. Guillaume Dufay surely transmitted the music in Cambrai VI, but either Dufay or Nicolas Grenon, who returned to Cambrai in the early 1440s as well, could have brought the Unica in Cambrai XI. Alejandro Planchard thinks he composed the Gloria with the contratenor added by Du Fay. When this repertory is compared to the anonymous Mansural Curies in the St. Emram Codex, it's clear that this is music of an entirely different style. In both cases, I argue that these comp compositions in Cambrai 6 and 11 and in Sankt Emram are in fact not cantus fractus, but simply mensural monophony. The term cantus fractus should probably be reserved for melodies of monophonic chant like sequences and hymns that are transmitted in mensural notation that requires a rhythmic performance. Thank you. Okay, just a moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your paper. So I see a lot of hands. Uh, I don't know who was the first, so maybe. Uh, so uh, there's a question. Uh, okay. Um, and uh, so I would like to uh, ask you whether there are some questions to Barbara's paper. Thank you, Barbara, for this paper, especially for these definitions and explaining some issues relate, relating to Cantus Fractus terminology. Uh, so you can ask questions uh, using your chat or maybe... Yeah, I cannot uh, see the chat right now, so... Um, and also for... If time is a concern, people can email questions to me. I think it's very important that you emphasize that it's a difference between composed mensural monophonic music yes. uh, and cantus fractus, or maybe generally cantus fractus composed, can, as com, uh, composed cantus fractus and cantus fractus as a practice. Uh, between orality and 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 written uh, written um, uh, sources. Uh, so maybe some questions. Oh, okay. Oh no, uh, this is Sarah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me answer that. The question is whether the Sanctus and Agnus were only done in side chapels. Yeah. No. Okay. No. I think Cambrai 11 is the later manuscript, and it postdates the foundation of Pierre Dailly of a mass in the main choir. I think that was the reason for the addition of the Sanctus and Agnus. I do not think the Sanctus and Agnus were performed in chapels, because very often they didn't have a lot of time to hold their masses. 
Yeah, I didn't know if I heard that correctly or not. So I was like, I should, I should ask yeah. for clarification. Yeah. I also have another question, if you don't mind. Um, sure. You mentioned in passing uh, something about um, Marion Mass that was important at Tournai. Um, can you talk about that? Oh, that's the Marion Chapel of the Flemish Virgin. Okay. Uh, there is a long-standing connection with Tournai of that chapel. If it does go back. And I, of course, there's probably much to be said about connections with Tournay and Cambrai and that particular virgin, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to go into it here. We can email about it later. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much for this uh, question and very short <laughs> discussion, uh, but we should move to second paper. So thank you, Barbara, for your paper again. I hope we will have more time for discussing uh, during this